Hi everyone, I'm Amy and I'm from Tales from the Heart. Thank you for joining me again for Folklore Thursday. The tale I've got for you today is one that I used to tell quite a while ago. Um, it was back when I used to work um, at a reconstructed Iron Age village. I adapted it to um, be set within uh, the Iron Age period so that it would fit in with uh, what we've been teaching through the day. Um, but I actually found this tale in a book called Kent Folk Tales by Tony Cooper, um, an active uh, storyteller from that area. Um, he himself adapted it from um, a story from the Thousand and One Nights. It just goes to show you that st storytelling is just so wonderful in the sense that you literally, you know, the sto stories change the more you tell them and everyone puts their own personality into them. So before I continue with our story today, if you like what you hear and you'd like to leave a tip rather than leave a tip for um, myself, if you could uh, please donate anything that you would have given to the Trussell Trust, um, there's a link just above me um, to tell you more about the work they do and links to a donation page will be below. The Trussell Trust is a really great cause because even before the pandemic happened they were doing so much great work to help struggling families when they were um, finding it difficult to put food on the table um, but they've been offering even more support to you know a, a lot more people who needed their services um, due to the impact of coronavirus uh, on employment and things so I, I, I would really urge you to donate whatever you can um, if you can that is um, if, if you can't donate that's absolutely fine just please forward our video on um, so that it can get a wider reach and um, hopefully um, get a few, get a couple more quid going to people who really need it. This is the story of the man who could understand animals. Sam the Shepherd was sitting on a hillside watching over his flock of sheep and his sheepdog. Well, actually I should say this was not his flock of sheep and the sheepdog was not his own. These animals did actually belong to his master, Farmer Gittens. But Sam was the one who knew these animals so well. Sam had a real connection with animals. Um, you could say he got on with, with animals a lot better than people. For he was the one who seemed to know when they were hungry or thirsty or knew if they were in pain or sick. And he would be the first to, to help them and look after them at this time. And as much as he wished he, he, that these animals were his own, he was just grateful to um, be a part of their lives really. He looked over the hillside and the sun was getting lower in the sky and he could see the smoke coming from the chimneys of, diff of the houses below um, and the smells wafted from the houses of um, housewives cooking dinner. But he also got a whiff of smoke but it wasn't coming from the houses down below it was coming closer to where he was where the flock of sheep were this made sam wary for he he knew that if there was fire nearby he needed to make sure that all the sheep were accounted for and so taking his crook he stood up and with the command of stay to the sheepdog he went to investigate and see where the smoke was coming from he passed by lots of familiar places where little lambs had got stuck many times before. Brambles and bushes where they got stuck upside down. But there was nothing there. It was, it was further on. And as he came closer, he saw that it was a ring of fire. And in the middle of it was a snake. Its scales shimmered blue and green and the poor creature was terrified. It kept trying to find a gap, a place to escape, but the closer it got to the heat of the flames, it would recoil right back to where it was in the middle. Sam was a bit more feared of, sh of snakes compared to other animals, but this was still an animal nonetheless, and he couldn't stand to see an animal suffer like this, and so he knew he had to help. Taking his shepherd's crook, he lowered it into the middle of the ring of fire, hoping that he could scoop the snake up and sort of toss it somewhere. 
out of harm's way. But the snake had other ideas. As the crook lowered into the ring of fire, the snake wound itself around and around the crook, moving closer and closer towards Sam's hands as he inched it out of harm's way. But before he could put the crook down, the snake had moved from the wooden crook itself all the way up his arm and then it wound itself around Sam's neck. Sam gulped, thinking this was the end. He daren't tug and pull at the snake to get it off, for who knows what could happen. It could tighten its grip, it could bite him out of fear. Animals are unpredictable like that. And so he stood, frozen in fear, with his eyes closed, hoping that the snake would mean him no harm. Now the snake was inches from his face. And to Sam's utter surprise, it spoke to him. So, the snake said, you rescue snakes, do you? A very noble thing to do on this day. For you see, I am the king of snakes. And you have done me a great service. You seem to care very much about the animals around you. And for this, I shall give you a gift. What do you desire most in the world? Sam thought long and hard about this. So now the thing that pops into most of our heads is money. And this, this popped into Sam's head as well. But he thought to himself, people are ruined very easily by money. The same with jewels. And even the thought of owning his own farm and having his own land. He hesitated. He felt he had a good life and he, he was worried about appearing greedy. And so instead, he asked for something else. Um, if it's all right, Sam stammered, I would like the ability to talk to animals. The snake laughed. <laughs> So it's a supernatural gift you seek, is it? Very well. But you must understand that if you breathe a word of this secret ability that I am going to give you, your head shall burst forth into a thousand pieces. Do you understand? Sam nodded and the snake opened its jaws wide and its forked tongue slithered outwards towards him and a purple vapour clouded around Sam's face. It smelled, it smelled of no smoke he had ever smelt in his life. It was, it was like incense, it was like gunpowder, it was like pepper. He felt as if his lungs would burst, he coughed and he spluttered and when he opened his eyes. The snake had gone. The snake had disappeared. Sam looked around for it. It was not there. And so he called out to the air around him. Uh, thank you? Sam thought perhaps he'd been tricked. Perhaps he didn't have a gift after all. Oh, well, he thought. You win some, you lose some. And he thought time was getting on. He needed to get back to the sheep and the sheepdogs to take them back to Farmer Gittins. But as he came away from this patch of meadow. The overwhelming sound hit him straight away of animal noises, but they weren't noises. The air was full of conversations from the birds. Insects hummed happily as they flew around him. The sheepdog was there, but it seemed to be dreaming about bones for it was talking in his sleep. My bones strap. And the sheep themselves were full of strange conversations. Ma! Ma! Where are you? Ma! I haven't felt right since that shearing. It's an awful cut. I can't do anything with it. Now Sam could hear the animal's conversation. His work became even easier. Now he knew exactly what they needed and when. And the animals just seemed to like him more and more. One day, back on the land of Farmer Gittens, Sam was sitting underneath a tree, eating bread and cheese. 
when two rooks circled overhead and then landed on a branch above him and they began to have a conversation. Quack, said one, this, this tree here has had so much history to it, my lad. Oh, I, re I remember that robbery it took place. Oh, how many, ever many summers ago it was. Do you remember it? Quack, no, you haven't told me this story. Quack, well. See here, a hanging took place at this tree. This thief stole all the treasure from the manor house up yonder. And well, the owners didn't like that. They took matters in their own hands. When they caught him, they hung him from this very tree. But you see, what they didn't think to do was to ask him where he buried all their loot. Quack, do you know where it's buried then? Asked the other crow. Quack, would you believe it? It's buried right underneath this here tree. Quack. Did you get to eat his eyes? Were they nice? Quack. As it happens, they were. Ooh, you're talking of eyes, and now you've made me hungry. I smell a dead calf on the wind. Let's let's go and see if there's some nice juicy eyes to eat over that way. Quack. Wait for me, wait for me, said the other. Sam could not believe his ears. Underneath him right now was some old treasure. He could be rich beyond his wildest dreams. But then he thought, this being Farmer Gitten's land, it was only fair that he tell his master. Now Sam did leave the part out where he said he'd overheard two rooks talking of this treasure. He called them visiting strangers that he'd overheard somewhere. Now, Farmer Gittens wanted to try his luck and see if he could find the treasure. And uh, naturally, he needed Sam's help. And so the two men taking or taking shovels, they went to that spot and they dug and they saw off pieces of root. And it seemed for a long time that they were never going to find anything. And then the shovel hit something hard and underneath the ground, was an old iron chest. When broken open, there was treasure abound. There were old, old coins from kings and queens that were long since dead. There were gold dishes, there were golden cups, torques and other pieces of jewellery. There was more wealth in this chest than either of these men could spend in their lifetime. Farmer Gittens was a fair man. He generously gave Sam a third of this treasure, which Sam was very grateful to receive. When he took his sack home with him, he had to keep looking inside of it to make sure that it wasn't a dream. Sam remembered the gleam of the riches from the window of the jewellery shop in Dover. In exchange for one golden spoon, Sam came away with a big handful of gold coins. The first thing he bought for himself was a good sturdy pair of boots. And then he paid a visit to the barber, for it had been a very long time since he'd had his hair cut and his beard shaved. For you see, he'd never had to look particularly nice for anyone, or for himself. Didn't seem to matter before. And he looked very different, and then he went to the tailors to get some new clothes made for him, to fit him just so, that were practical and hard-wearing for his job, but it was nice wearing brand new material on his body. After a season had gone by, Sam had bought the cottage that he lived in and some land and a, f a few sheep and two of the sheep dogs that Farmer Gittens owned. And there he had his own little farm all for himself. Sam was now his own master. For the people of Sibbertswold, it was as if a handsome stranger had come to live among them for Remember, Sam didn't mix with people before, and now he was quite the social animal. He was seen everywhere, in the pub, in the market, and he soon caught the eye of Widow Penny Groat. Widow Groat had lived in this village for about ten years or so. Her husband was rumoured to be a navy captain or an army captain of some sort. Whoever it was, it was someone who 
had a very nice pension for it was enough for Penny Groat to live on very, very comfortably. And one day she gave Sam a very nice smile over the cheese store one day. And that was that. They began courting. They would take walks over the meadow. They would have tea together. Sam bought a horse and he learned to ride. And it seemed to happen very quickly. All too soon, the two of them were married. Marriage was quite a new thing for Sam. He had no idea of how much washing of the hands, face and clothes needed to be done. She even made him take a bath. And it wasn't even Candlemas or Easter. Now, Penny Groat had been quite sweet to Sam while they were courting. But, as, but it seemed almost as soon as the wedding was over, her attitude had changed very quickly. By the Norman law of the time, it meant that Penny's wealth now became Sam's, which Sam didn't really need, having all the riches he could possibly want. Whereas Sam liked to save his money and buy things only that he really needed. Penny wanted to buy anything and everything. She wanted new plates, she wanted new pots and pans, she wanted new rugs, she wanted new furniture, cupboards to put all their new things in. This was overwhelming. After a while, Sam thought, looking around his cottage, that they were going to need a new place to live. And it was on one of these shopping trips to the market in Canterbury one day, where both horses that the couple had were fully laden. Her fine half-Arab stallion struggled and strained under the sheer weight of his mistress and all the items. And coming up behind the stallion was Sam atop his mare. As the two animals were labouring up the hill of Dover Road, the Arab stallion could not hold it in any longer. The poor mare was right behind him, breathing heavily under the weight of all the items she was carrying. When suddenly the Arab farted, causing the mare to snort wildly and cry out, oh, Couldn't you have waited? He also heard the stallion say back, You wouldn't be able to hold it in either if you were carrying this fat sow and all her goods. Sam couldn't help it. He burst out laughing. Ha! His wife whipped around to look at him from her saddle. What are you laughing at? She asked. Panicked, Sam looked about him. Uh, uh, look over there, dear. Look at that chimney pot uh, on that cottage. It's all <laughs> bent and out of shape. Have you ever seen anything so funny in all your life? Penny scowled at him. There is nothing funny about that chimney pot. You're telling fibs. I think you're laughing at me. What are you laughing at? Um, my dear, Sam said, I, 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 I really cannot tell you. Something terrible will happen to me if I do. I'm sorry. Sorry? You're sorry? Penny spat at him. Just you wait till we get home. I'll make you sorry. And so all the ride home, the two of them didn't speak to one another. And when the horses had been fed and watered, Sam carried all of the goods that they had bought from Canterbury Market into the house. After such a busy day, he couldn't wait to have something to eat. And Penny had been working on something which smelled delicious. On the air, he could smell roast pork, roast potatoes, and, ve and the sweet smell of vegetables and savoury gravy. Oh, he couldn't wait. He sat down at the table expectantly, but what appeared in front of him was the cracked plate that he used to feed scraps to the dogs, and on it was a few dirty bacon rinds, some burnt egg whites and an onion skin. Penny stood over it, gloating. Now that's all you're going to get until you tell me what it is you were laughing at. Sam sighed, but he said nothing. He didn't eat a thing. Instead, he retired early to bed, and Penny followed soon after. But every hour upon the hour, Sam would be awoken by his wife shaking him awake and shouting in his ear, What were you laughing at? Didn't make any odds to Penny 
waking up every hour to do this, for you see, she could sleep in the next day while Sam was out shepherding. Over the next week or so, Sam caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror. His eyes underneath were very dark and he had a haunted look about him and he was so very pale with tiredness. For you see, he had no real food to eat and he was awoken every hour, every night by his wife. That in the end he could stand it no longer. On Friday morning he spoke to a builder and the next day, two men turned up with a coffin and they dumped it outside the door of the cottage. Penny looked indignantly at it. What on earth is this doing here? She asked. Why on earth is there a coffin here? Don't look at us, mistress, the builder said. We've just been asked to take a coffin here. We was told someone was going to be dying today. It's all been paid for. I don't care if it's been paid for or not. Take it away in at once. Oh, you see, it's been custom made, mistress. We can't take it away now. And just who was it made for? Oh, it was a gentleman. The one who owns this cottage. Sam! Widow Grote called out. What is the meaning of this? Why is there a coffin outside our house? Well, Sam said as the builders left. He nodded to them. It's all about tidiness, really, he said cryptically. Tidiness? What, what are you saying, husband? You're not making any sense. Well, you know, Sam said how ever since that day at the market when you caught me laughing at something, you won't let me sleep or eat. Yes, I remember, Penny said. Well, Sam said, as soon as I tell you this, my head is going to burst into a thousand pieces and, well, I thought if it has happened inside the coffin, it, it wouldn't make such a mess all over the yard and you wouldn't have such a mess to clear up and then you could just put the lid on and forget all about me. The cockerel overheard this and wandered over to the sheepdog. Oh, sounds like the master's about to tell the mistress our little secret, he said. His head's going to explode into a thousand pieces, just you watch. Just you wait. But I tell you this, he said, if, she, if his wife was like one of my hens, she'd get a right pecking. The sheepdog was upset to hear this news. This, 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 we can't let this happen. Oh no, our master is so kind to us. No, I must go and visit the king of snakes. Perhaps he can help. And so the sheepdog bounded away back up to the hillside back to the stone of rock near the brambles where the snake seemed to live. And he barked and he barked and the snake appeared before him. What can I do for you, dog? The snake said. And the sheepdog told the snake, you remember our master many, many years ago, you, you gave him the gift to speak to animals, yes? Well, he's, he has no choice. He's about to tell his wife all about it, and I don't want his head to burst into a thousand pieces. He's a good master, he's a kind master, and, well, he saved your life once, didn't he? I know you did him a this favour all this time ago, but you must help him, you must. The snake thought on it. But once he tells his wife this secret, there will be nothing I can do. I have it, the snake said. And he opened his jaws wide and that same purple vapour went into the air and it hov and the smoke hovered over Sam's cottage where Sam was lying in the coffin ready and just advising Penny to, uh, if you, darling, if you, if you could just leave a gap uh, for, for, so you can hear what I'm saying, but then at least the lid is on top of me. Right, um, are you ready for this, dearest? <sighs> Sam, just, just, just get on with it. Penny said. <sighs> Sam took a deep breath as the sheepdog darted back into the yard out of breath fearfully. Well, my dear, Sam said, that day at Canterbury, do you remember how both our horses were uh, carrying us and carrying all our goods on top of us? Yes, 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 I remember. They were lovely, lovely presents. Get on with it. Well, Sam said. 
You see, your horse was carrying you and so much things that um, it farted into the face of my mare that I was riding. And my horse asked, couldn't, couldn't it wait? And the horse replied, well, well, no, you, well, no, because I am carrying this fat sow upon my back and all of her goods. And you see, the only reason I could hear and understand all of this is because I can understand and talk to animals. For you see, I saved a snake's life once and he, 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 was the, he happened to be the king of the snakes. And so he gave me this gift. And that is what I was laughing at. And Sam closed his eyes. But his head didn't explode. Puzzled. He was, he was waiting to hear the, the screams and the anger and the name calling that was to come from Penny Grope. But nothing happened. But he could hear a clucking hen below him. And so pushing the lid above him, he looked down. Penny was there no longer. What was there instead was an indignant hen cluck, cluck, clucking away. For you see, the snake had transformed old widow Penny into a hen. So Sam hadn't told another human being his secret. He'd only told a hen, really. And from that day on, Penny the hen had to go and live with the other chickens and the cockerel, who never really liked her from the beginning. For you see, she never really smelt right from the get-go. And every time she would look at a piece of grain that the cockerel wanted, she would get a sound pecking from him. Sam was seen with girl after girl after that, but he never remarried. He much preferred the company of his animals and the peace and quiet and the good life on his farm. He became a very popular and prosperous man of the area. So much so that they even changed the name of the village from Sibbetswold to Shepherdswell. And now you know why. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the story of the man who could understand animals as much as I enjoyed telling it. If you enjoyed what you heard, give this video a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. You can find a whole wealth of stories in our lockdown storytelling playlist to keep you amused. Please do share it with anyone that you think would also enjoy it. Like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Keep an eye out on those over the next week or so because Andy and I have got uh, hopefully a very exciting announcement coming up for you. As lockdown's beginning to ease for us all now, I hope you're all still staying safe out there and looking after one another and um, look forward to seeing you next week for another Folklore Thursday. Bye bye.